Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here. It's a privilege to be able to finish off this series that we've been doing in the church today uh, as we uh, focus in on a, a, unique, a unique aspect of uh, the Christian faith. Uh, something that's unique about what we believe as Christians uh, is the way God calls us forward in the here and now by our hope. Uh, and, and hope is a future-oriented thing. Hope, by definition, is uh, an expectation of the future. And that future has already been won for us by Jesus. And not only won for us, but also revealed to us by Jesus. Which is a wonderful thing. And like one Christian writer said, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of wishful thinking for the Christian but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. And if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those who thought most of the next. And this is, in a large part, what the Lord has revealed to us in this book of Revelation. And this book is unique in many ways, but especially because it's written in what is known as an apocalyptic form of literature. That is, it's a, it's a vision that is revealing a heavenly perspective on historical events in light of their final outcome. And it was Jesus who gave this vision to the Apostle John... For this purpose, it's written at the start of the book and at the end of the book. It's written to show His servants what must soon take place. So that we would know. And by knowing, be filled with confidence to trust and obey the Lord Jesus. And in this vision that we're looking at today, we see the church in glory. That is, those who are faithful servants of Jesus, who persevere through trial and now stand before the throne of Jesus in heaven, among the whole company of angelic beings who are there in heaven now as we speak, praising Jesus in the flesh for all He's done. Church, I want you to cast your mind back eight weeks when we began our series in the church, that very first passage we looked at from Matthew chapter 16. We talked about the church's foundation, and and in that chapter of Scripture, Jesus said, He made a promise. The word church was used for the very first time in the New Testament. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, only Jesus had in his mind what he was hoping to build at that point in time. But when Jesus made that promise, we know that he didn't have in his mind a building or a denomination, but a people. And not even a people here on earth, because what we go through here is kind of like a transitional period. But the church that Jesus was picturing in his mind that he was building this final outcome was His people gathered together in heaven, saved and set apart, at peace and at rest, enjoying Him for all eternity, overflowing with joy and gratitude because of who Jesus is and what He's done. And Jesus gave us this vision. He gave this vision to the Apostle John And then John gave that vision to us, his servants, so that we would be fueled by the joy of that moment, of that future that includes all us here who have been washed by the blood of Jesus because of our faith and commitment to him. And so that we can see it, I'll encourage you to go to Revelation chapter 7. We'll begin by looking at verses 9 and 10, and then we'll work our way through the rest of the chapter. 
So verses 9 and 10. The Apostle John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so in those couple of verses, I want us to notice three things. Firstly, notice that every nation is represented in heaven. And that is because the gospel of the kingdom is for all nations. Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. And like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, this gospel of the kingdom, it will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations And then the end will come. And what we're seeing here in this vision is all nations represented in heaven because the Lord remained faithful to His promise to build His church. And the Great Commission was successfully accomplished through His servants. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice are the white robes and the palm branches of those who are in heaven. The white robes represent holiness and purity because everyone who's there has been washed clean of their sin by Jesus. And the palm branches are symbols of victory. Right, victory that comes through conquest. They are powerful symbols because those who are holding the palm branches are not representing those who have never gone through trial. They are those who represent those who have gone through trial and have overcome. They are victorious. Why? Because Christ, who is their king, has fought the battle for them and has won. And they are now at rest and at peace around the throne of their king. The third thing to notice is that this great multitude are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, as if there's two there, but the reality is there's one. They're singing that salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb, as if there's two, but in reality there's one. We know this because in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, John has already told us that he saw the Lamb standing in the center of the throne. A few verses later, in chapter 5, verse 9, you'll notice John describes this great multitude for the first time as they're standing around the throne with Jesus on it, in the middle of it. Here in chapter 7, verse 10, it's God who sits on His throne, making the point, as Jesus Himself did when He was alive, that He and the Father are one. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. And that is because the Lamb, who is the Lord Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. When you see Jesus, you see God. And when you receive Jesus, you receive God. When you worship Jesus... You worship God. 
and we're told that He is worthy of all glory and honor and praise, not only because He was slain, and with His blood He purchased for God people from every tribe, nation, people, and language, but because He created all things, and by His will they were created and have their being. This is our Jesus. That's why He's the champion of heaven and the champion of His church. And I want us to notice here, church, that what marks the church in glory is what should also mark the church on earth. All nations represented, or at least welcomed, gathered together as one, worshipping Jesus for who He is and what He's done. A few years ago, when we first started our church, when we were meeting back in Smithfield, we had a person who used to meet with us, came across very mature in his faith, but he came up to me one day, he said, I love the preaching here, everything that's happening is wonderful, but you keep on every week going over the gospel. Jesus died, Jesus rose. He said, I know you're doing that probably because there's a lot of people who are young in the faith here and that they need to hear it and at the time I was young enough as a pastor myself not to pick up on the problem that was behind that statement but it wasn't long after that 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 something happened within the life of the church and this person simply packed up and left and as I reflected on that later and even as I've been reflecting on this passage here in heaven of what we're seeing playing out in heaven. Friends, those who are in heaven are going to be celebrating the gospel every day for all eternity. If Jesus dying and rising for you ever becomes news that is somewhat dated, the problem isn't that you're hearing it too much. It's that you're not reflecting enough on what that means for you. But when Jesus taught us to pray, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, we're supposed to look to these visions of heaven to see how we are supposed to act here on earth. They're designed by God to lead us to a better understanding of who we are in light of all that God has prepared for us. And so to apply these two verses quickly, if we are here today and we are not united together as one, here and now among God's people and in Jesus In the blood of Christ, despite our differences, we are not fulfilling the will of God for us in Jesus revealed in this vision. We've got to work at that though, don't we? If we're not living lives marked with holiness and purity now, we're not living out the reality of who we are in Christ. And church, if you can't find the voice to sing praise to Jesus now among His people, you are out of alignment with those who are in glory, who are ever singing praise to Jesus because of who He is to them. But I hope you understand how these visions of heaven are given to us to motivate our hearts so that we would bring them into alignment with what is happening in glory, so that the will of God is accomplished here on earth as it's happening in heaven. Because that's what we as God's people are supposed to be representing while we're here on earth. And notice how central Jesus is to everything that happens there. At the risk of laboring the point... (laughs) There is no eternal kingdom without an eternal king. I want us to notice the centrality of Jesus in this vision. Because if we were content, and sometimes 
I think we all have a tendency to, 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 be, to have a mindset like this, to, to be tempted to desire all that heaven has, eternal life and peace and rest, but without Jesus, if we were content to have everything that heaven has, but be content if Jesus weren't there, I want us to understand that our understanding of who we are in Christ and what our future will be is completely out of alignment with what we see in Scripture. I want you to imagine something for me, with, with me in, in a moment. Now, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine heaven as we see it. And all eyes are on Jesus. He's so captivating that no one seems to be looking anywhere else. There aren't many songs in heaven, but no one seems to care because they're all focused on Jesus and everyone's happy to sing to Him all the time. And He's so glorious that there's not one little part of the kingdom that isn't glowing and reflecting the glory that comes from Him and His throne. It seems to light up everything that's there. Imagine you take him out of that kingdom. I want you to imagine what is left of the kingdom. I want you to imagine the great multitude without Christ on his throne. What are they doing? Who are they looking at? What are they singing? Who are they serving? As I've imagined this this week, I've pictured the great multitude looking at each other. Serving themselves. Singing songs about themselves. And all these desires that they have that remain unfulfilled. Instead of marveling at Jesus, I imagine them looking at each other to try to find who's got the most impressive gift so that they can glorify them. I'd say the love of those who were there would grow cold. And without Jesus present there, I couldn't imagine anything else happening but the truth of God being exchanged for a lie and the citizens of the kingdom going back to worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. Church, I want us, I want us to, to see that if we take Jesus out of His kingdom, His kingdom becomes Fairfield. Liverpool. Immediately. You take Jesus out of Eden and it becomes a desert. And we are without God and without hope in the world. All that to say, let the church in glory judge our heart and mind now so that our lives will reflect the will of God for us in light of this reality, primarily with Jesus seated on His throne as King over everything for you, if you belong there. Because one day the King is going to come and those who will enter into His kingdom will be the ones who've demonstrated that they belong there because they've lived in a way that reflects that Jesus is on His throne here and now. If it's a reality for you now in the Spirit, it'll be a reality for you then when He comes physically in the flesh. And notice here, simply to fuel your, your longing or to whet your appetite, you're going to have to use your imagination here it's not only people who are present in glory, but all the hosts of heaven. Try to get your head around verses 11 and 12. 
John tells us all the angels were surrounding, were, were standing, sorry, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. God help us to visualize what John is describing here. In the Old Testament, we're told that in the time of Isaiah, one angel went out and put to death 185,000 soldiers in one night. We're told one angel turned up at the tomb where Jesus' body was, and the soldiers who were there became like dead men. Even the prophets in the Old Testament, the angel turns up, and unless he gives them strength to stand, they fall face down on the ground. What we have here are all the angels. We're told there are legions of angels, thousands upon thousands, and they're all there. Standing around the throne. And not only them, but notice those four living creatures that are mentioned here. Church, in, in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation that we're in, we're told that John is invited to come up through an open door into heaven so that he can see what is happening there. And John describes these four living creatures. He says, one was like a lion, one was like an ox, another one had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle, and each of them had six wings. So not only do we have all the angels around the throne, but you've got these four living creatures who are there surrounding the throne as well, which I can imagine would make a lion here on earth look like a cat, at best. And we're told day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. These creatures are astounded by God. Jesus, in all His glory, all of their attention is on Him. And they are marveling at Him. And the elders are mentioned here. Again, they're only mentioned in passing, but in chapter 4, you get a, a better description. We're told there's 24 of them, 24 elders, which seems to be a, a, a representative number. It's 12 plus 12, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of the Lamb. It's like the full number of the old and the new covenants coming together. The representatives are there in heaven and they're falling down before the throne of God, laying down their crowns in worship of Jesus. And as we hear of this vision of heaven, and we see the people of God in glory, we have to understand that the purpose for why God gave this vision to John, an extension to us, was so that it would tune our hearts to beat to this reality. If you are in Christ, this is your future. And it's not only to fuel our joy in Christ, to bear witness to the fact that serving this King is perfect freedom and not a drag, but also because we are all going to have to suffer for our faith. If you're going to remain faithful to Jesus, it's going to 
require a degree of suffering. And if we're not motivated by the joy that is set before us, described in part by these visions here, we rob ourselves of the fuel that God intended to provide for us to persevere in hope. And I want us to notice, church, that these people are those who persevere through trial. Read this with me from verse 13. John says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, it might seem a little bit odd. Does it seem odd to you that the elder asks the question to John, who are they, and he already knows the answer? you find that odd? I think it's designed this way to draw our attention to another vision that God gave to a man named Ezekiel in the Old Testament where a similar thing happens. God, for some reason, is trying to connect our minds to see something. In Ezekiel 37, God gives the prophet a vision of a valley full of dry bones, lifeless. And God says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel replies saying, sovereign Lord, you know. And then God says to him, speak, prophesy, and bring them to life. And here, John replies like Ezekiel, saying, Sir, you know. You know who they are. And sure enough, the elder explains that this multitude in heaven have come out of the great tribulation. Now, church, in Revelation chapter 6, we're told that the Lamb, who is Jesus, opens six seals and they cause great distress upon the earth. Famine, Death, war, earthquakes, fear, and wrath. And then chapter 7 begins with another seal, a different kind of seal. I want you to read this with me. Chapter 7, we'll read verses 2 and 3. Revelation 7, verse 2. And then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, John doesn't see a people there in chapter 7. He doesn't see the servants of God. All he does is hear. He hears a number, 144,000. 144,000 have been sealed and saved by God. if there are 24 elders, as a representative number of 12 plus 12, something like that, here we have 144,000, who again seems like a representative number of 12,000 times 12,000. The full number of God's people who are in heaven. 
And then we get to the passage that we're looking at in chapter 7, verse 9. And John says, after this, right after hearing this, then I looked and I saw. And what does he see? A great multitude that no one could count. The number he saw, he now sees, which shows us that it is a representative number of those who have been sealed by God and set apart for eternal life. Why? Because they washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb. Marked with a seal and set apart for eternal life. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, he says to the people of God, having believed in Jesus, we were marked with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. You want to know if you're going to persevere through trial? The Holy Spirit is in you. And if He's in you, you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Now, church, this great tribulation could be in part referring to that time of hardship and suffering that Jesus and the apostles talk about that will take place right before the Lord returns. It's interesting that this great tribulation, that exact phrase is also used in Revelation chapter 2, that Jesus threatens to inflict on people who are sexually immoral. It could refer to the distress and tribulation that was described in chapter 6 that will test God's people's faithfulness to Jesus. Or it could be a representation of all those who persevere through trial and remain faithful to Jesus, even to the point of death. The point remains that like this great multitude in heaven the only way we'll be able to stand before the throne of God is if we persevere through trial, having washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And you know that you have done that when you wake up every morning with a desire to be clean and pure in the sight of the Lord. This is what the white robes symbolize. And so it is right for us to say that those who wear the white robes in heaven clothe themselves in Christ, the spotless lamb here on earth. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And these people never stop praising Jesus and therefore, they receive their reward in full. This reward, described in part in verse 15. Read this with me. This is chapter 7, verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And friends, that right there is the hope of all who walk with Jesus here on earth. As one theologian put it, as he commented on this verse, these people are happy in their employment, for they serve God continually. Heaven is a state of service though not of suffering. It is a state of rest, yet not of laziness. It is a praising, delightful rest. And they are happy in their freedom as they serve God continually. And the benefit of being in the presence of the Lord of glory is what is then described in verse 16. Never again will they hunger. 
Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Church, this is a set of promises here that mean the world to those who hunger for righteousness. And a set of promises that will mean the world to those who know what it feels like to labor for the Lord to the point of exhaustion. You wish they had the energy to keep on going. For those who truly desire to be shepherded by the Lord Jesus, the promise of being led to springs of living water would mean the world to those who've spent a lifetime living off the dew of heaven, that water for our souls that we get as we plumb the depths of God's Word to try to water us day in and day out. And the thought of God wiping every tear from our eye is a comfort if we know what it is to mourn. Over the reality of where we are in light of where we'll be with Christ when He returns. And I reckon one of the hardest things for us as a church here in Sydney is that life is often so comfortable already that we don't appreciate enough of what Christ has won for us. In the Spirit, we get it. But these are also physical realities. And I want you to imagine what these promises would mean to a Christian who was truly oppressed for their faith. Someone who knew what it was to hunger and thirst and seek and work and mourn, not only because of spiritual realities, but because it is a description of their life, both in the spirit and in the flesh. Can you imagine what a comfort God's word would be to them as we see a picture of them in glory? But of course, it's not only to them, but us as well here, because like the Apostle Paul said to the church in Rome in chapter 8, we who have the Spirit of God, we groan as we eagerly await our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. These visions of the church in glory are supposed to be an anchor for our soul as it reminds us what Christ has promised to those who remain faithful to Him despite the costs. This is the hope that's supposed to lead us forward. Church, in the Old Testament, there's a book called Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 13, we're told, hope deferred or delayed, it makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And church, these visions of the church in glory are described in vivid terms to us so that they would be our longings. Longings that we know are being fulfilled as we speak. And God gives them to us so that they would be a tree of life as we persevere in hope for the return of Christ and to see the reality of all these things in the flesh. You know, church, when I gave my life to Jesus, very early on, I was in my 20s, and I'm there having a conversation with someone who was in his 60s. And as I had a conversation with this older man, I was thinking about the difference between the two of us and how I can try to communicate the gospel to him. And I said to him, tell me, in your mind, where does it rest? 
Does it rest in the future or does it rest in the past? And this gentleman thought about it and he said, you know what, I guess it's always resting in the past. And I'd never thought about it at the time, but as someone who was in my early to mid-twenties, that's a, that's a difference between us, isn't it? I'm thinking about the future. I've got plans. I've got places I want to be, things I want to do. But it made me realize that at some point in all our lives, outside of Christ, we stop looking forward and we begin to look back. Maybe this is the point of midlife crisis, where all the glory days, where all your achievements, where everything that you ever looked forward to is done and dusted. It's in the past now. And as your body begins to break down, all you've got to look forward to is pain and death. And so you begin to look back and remember what it was like when you could run and jump and and do your hair nicely. Friends, that's a common, common experience. But I want us to notice that that is not the will of God for His people. Church, because these realities are anchored in heaven, no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, no matter how broken your body is, no matter how much suffering you have had to go through in life, these visions of heaven are given to us so that we never look back so that we always look forward knowing our best days are always in front of us, no matter how good it was before. This is what it is to persevere because of the hope that is set before you in Christ, because of what He has won for you on the cross when He put all your sin to death, And rose from the dead, defeating death, so that it does not have a hold on you anymore. Church, let's pray now that this heavenly reality will continue to shape who we are as the church and motivate us to persevere, come what may, in Jesus' name. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all that you have done for us and for all that you have won for us and not only won for us in Christ, but revealed to us to motivate us to persevere in hope. Lord, whether trials or temptations come, and we know they'll come, but regardless of that, we We lose hope every day without you. Lord, we know that where revelation ceases, Lord, we lose hope. As we live according to what we see with our eyes and not what we see with the eyes of faith, Father, we look to the world and we see distress and gloom and darkness and pain and suffering. We know that is not your will for us as your church. Father, I pray that you would continue by the power of your Spirit to reveal to us the things that you have won for us in Christ so that it would be like fuel to our souls, like those waters of refreshment, springs of living water, to give us the energy we need to persevere, joyfully serving Jesus despite the cost. Father, for those who are suffering at the moment, physically, emotionally, I pray that you would revive their souls, that these thoughts of heaven and the comfort that is there and you wiping the tears away and being our shepherd, 
that we would spend our time with you, never to be cast away, seeing you as you are in the flesh and not as in a reflection through a mirror. Lord, I pray that these visions would encourage those who are suffering, knowing, Lord, that these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Help us, Lord, please, to see everything in light of the future you have won for us in Christ, so that we would be so heavenly minded that we are of a maximum earthly benefit within the life of the church, within our families, and within our communities at large. And we pray for this gift in Jesus' name. Amen.